right. Okay, let's do this. My name is Jim. This is Jim Warfare, the Battle of Ideas. What matters to you? They cover the important story. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Michael Wilkerson, thank you for joining me in the trenches. How's it great to be with you today? Uh, it's not uh, America Day, I'm guessing, on your side of the world. <laughs> well, you know, to me, every day is America Day. You know, I, don't, I heard what you were saying about Australia. I get it. It's a, it's a shame that these days... Uh, one has to be ashamed of one's own uh, country, one's own land. And uh, I don't go for that. I believe we should love the place that we have to call home. Well, I mean, that was the segue that I was trying to create because I know that you um, are very pro um, sort of uh, American patriotism, which is something I want to unpack because as somebody who who lives on the African continent, you know, the way in which we interpret patriotism is quite different. But before we get to any of that, uh, Tell me a bit about your background. Sure. So I've uh, spent about 30 years as a, an investor, um, strategic advisor, M&A expert, uh, ran a, a company that was investing uh, in businesses in Africa and in South Africa in particular. Um, I've had a number of years of experience as a public company CEO um, and most recently as an author of two books, one called Stormwall, Observations on America in Peril, and most recently a book called Why America Matters, The Case for a New Exceptionalism, which just came out uh, a couple months ago and uh, very, uh, very excited to talk about. Mm. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, as an observer, I, I found what I saw coming out of the US during the Obama administration as quite disappointing. And then when when that big moment came in 2016, I remember waking up, my wife and I quietly celebrated when we saw that Trump had won and had beaten the entire establishment. And I, I, I must be honest, I really enjoyed his presidency for the most part. And there was a sense, at least from my side of the pond, that things were back on track. You know, I think a lot of Americans shared the view. I think at that time there was a growing and very deep frustration that things were on the wrong wrong track. And I think for many Americans, President Trump represented someone who listened to them, who saw them, who heard them, which they had not felt under President Obama or even under his predecessors. And so it was for many people a renewal of hope and confidence. And I, and I understand just like you have seen in uh, your own country and elsewhere, once um, the powers start to fight back, um, it really limits what any executive can do. And I think that's exactly what happened with President Trump was through the scandals and the corruptions of what we call Russia Gate or the Russian collusion hoax. Yeah. Uh, and everything that came out of that, uh, it made life very, very difficult. So we, we you know, we, we talk about it in, in, in the U.S. We talk about the idea of the of the swamp or the deep state. And I think uh, through those years and everything we're seeing coming out, even as recently as the last few weeks with the Twitter files, uh, just shows that uh, that uh, deep state is real, that it's colluding and working with big tech. Um, and I think many Americans are increasingly upset about it. I think it's important the revelations are happening, the information is coming out, uh, but now we, we, have to, we have to actually do something about it. Let me be blunt, why does America matter? Well, I think America matters because it has a unique place in the world. The ideas that were present at the founding were unique and hadn't really, you know, they'd been thought about, they'd been written about, they'd been talked about, but nowhere had they been put into practice. W what are some of those ideas? The ideas of equality, that all men were created equal. The ideas that everyone was endowed with God-given unalienable rights that could not be taken away by any state, by any government, by any king or prince, by any uh, bu bureaucracy, it was something that was given to us the idea of we the people, that the people were sovereign um, and, and, and would appoint elected officials to rule for them. Things like the separation of powers, the ideas of keeping uh, the judiciary, the legislative and executive branches separate so that there would not be too much accumulation of power in any one hand. And also federalism, that the states would have power that the federal government didn't have and vice versa. And then finally, the rule of law, including private property. But importantly, with the rule of law, the idea that no one was above the law. Again, no king or prince, no uh, three-lettered agency like the FBI or others were above the same enforcement and equal protections 
under the law. The challenge is that all of those things are under attack in America today. But to answer your question, why does America matter still? It's because those ideas, I believe America still represents a beacon of light and hope uh, because people love those ideas. They love the ideas of freedom, of liberty, of having their voice heard, of not being uh, oppressed by whether it be a you know, foreign power and, and, and colonialism or a domestic tyrant. America has always represented the ideals of freedom that most men and women around the world aspire to. I agree with you. And on my side of the pond, um, being a member of BRICS, uh, to to be a fan yeah. of the United States generally is generally politically incorrect. You know, you, you're supposed to be yeah. uh, opposed to, to the United States. And the truth of the matter is, no matter what anybody says, America to, still to this day is probably the greatest country on earth. You can pretty much do whatever you want. I don't know of too many countries in which you are allowed to dress up in a white outfit with a pointy with a pointy top, you know, and, and look out through little holes in the, <laughs> in the cylindrical sort of triangular shaped hood that you have on your head, you know, and 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 have that type of what would you call it cult, which is what, you know, the KKK is. I don't know of that many countries that allow that. You certainly can't do that here. Well, so and we didn't, you know, it's not freedom. really allowed here either. Let me, yeah, let me tell you, the history right. of the KKK was mm -hmm. it was the militarized arm of the Democratic Party after the Civil War. So when the South mm -hmm. gave up formal fighting, the Democratic Party was reconstituted. The KKK became, as I said, their sort of armed militarized group to go around terrorizing people. Um, and in fact, the reason why the Justice Department was first formed in 1870 under President Grant was to go after the KKK. And they did. And they pursued him. And of course, this sort of still lives on in history and people still sort of secretly and clandestinely agree agree with its values but uh, it really came out of that political dislocation and people who were unwilling to let go of the idea that um that all men were created equal and wanted to hold on to the legacy of slavery in the south yeah i was gonna say that um uh, I, I was gonna say that i agree with you that america does matter where i become critical is of course the u.s government and the deep state and i think everybody will agree with that um but how does one even begin to separate those two? Yeah. So one of the things I talk about in the book, Why America Matters, which are available online or at whyamericamatters.com, you know, I talk about a couple of big crises in facing our nation. One is just the, is the crisis of circumstances that all nations around the world are seeing today, whether it was with pandemic and lockdown response, um, sort of the, the uh, well, war in Europe now. Uh, all these things that are going on, but two important ones that I talk about that's relevant to answer your question. One is I talk about the crisis of identity. We are at a place mm -hmm. in, in, in the United States where Americans do not any longer have a great sense of who they are. They've lost their identity, lost the, the, the very idea of why does it matter? Why do the ideals of America matter? Is democracy important or not? Is capitalism and free markets? Does it matter? And especially as you go younger and younger in age cohort, there's a lot of confusion out there. The other, I called it the crisis of institutions, which is the point that you're hitting on, which is that today, our federal government institutions, the three-lettered agencies, as we call them, are failing us. They are failing us both mm. through ineptitude, incompetence, but also a deep corruption. And I think that that has to be hit head on. You know, we've entered this age of the surveillance state, uh, which you know, once the technology is out there, you can't go back from it, but there can be constraints on power. And so one of the things that I do find encouraging, and I mentioned the Twitter files earlier, but the first step in this process is transparency, is uh, mm -hmm. revealing what's going on. More and more Americans are becoming aware, people who were skeptical and thought that these were just crazy conspiracy theories now realize, no, no, these are real encroachments by the government against the people. And the mm -hmm. next step is accountability. And I think we are entering an era where we're going to see some real accountability through uh, congressional hearings and committees. This has happened before in the 1970s. There was something called the Church Committee, Senate Committee, uh, that looked mm -hmm. into a lot of the abuses that had been going on by the CIA around the world, the FBI domestically, in targeting people like Martin Luther King Jr., etc. And so this is not unprecedented. We've been here before, unfortunately, for not the best reasons. My point is, is that it isn't a one-way street. We can uh, undo some of the damage that's been done. Well, I mean, I really hope that is the case, uh, because I mean, for example, here in South Africa, as you know, you probably know, we've got our own 
our own history of serious amounts of conflict yeah. between the people and the state. So I completely understand yep. what you're saying. But I think what is interesting to me is how this gets played out, how you, how you force this accountability that you are speaking about. And I think it has to be through the democratic process. It has to be through uh, enough Americans becoming concerned, appointing new congressional leaders. Uh, it's happening, but slowly. So there's been a, sh a shift in the majority leadership of the House of Representatives, the lower chamber here uh, in the US. And that is enough to at least get the, the, the process started. And it's by ensuring that the legal process is upheld and that uh, uh, each function continues to do what it does, that the judiciary remains independent. And, you know, by the way, I think about where the strengths in South Africa lie. It's in similar things, an independent judiciary, a strong uh, and, and historically independent treasury and a vocal free press. It's, you know, it was great to see that even through the dark, the darkest of the Zuma years, uh, the press was allowed to say what it wanted to say about what was going on. So I think you need all of those formal and informal structures including uh, grassroots organizations. Let me give you an example here again from, from the United States. There have been a lot of people, a lot of parents concerned about uh, indoctrination of their children in public schools and teaching of a lot of confusing ideas that science doesn't matter, that biology isn't real, that you can be whatever gender you want. And parents <laughs> have started to push, you know, parents have started to push back on that. And they were told, no, no, you parents stay away. And they were actually intimidated by the Department of Justice to say, oh, you know, this is this is domestic violence for you to stand up and resist. And the parents would not back down. And what happened? Well, they actually overturned the Board of Supervisors of the school. And in the state, in the state of Virginia, they overturned the governor and put in somebody who was advocating on a platform of parental rights. Why do I tell that story? I just make the point to say, yes, you need it in the national elections. Yes, you need the formal processes. Mm -hmm. But you also need the formal of of the media of work that uh, people like you and others are doing and citizens taking a small role whatever it is they can do in any walk of life that they can uh, and when you add up millions and millions of actors it begins to make a difference but michael let's be honest you're not a biologist how can you know what a woman is <laughs> well you've got me there uh jeremy I, I, excuse me you got me there i don't i don't know uh <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I think enough of us know uh, to know when we see truth and when we see a lie. And this is part of what I call the, uh, the, you know, the ideological attack is there's also been yeah. this underlying attack on the very ideas of, of truth. And do words matter? Do they mean what they say they're going to mean? You know, all of this is um, intended to confuse. It's intended to to render people sort of confused and helpless as to what is true, what is not true. So it's actually a much broader attack than just the question of uh, whether a woman is a woman, which of course is so <laughs> fundamental. It's amazing that we're even having to talk about this issue. Yeah, and, well, exactly. <laughs> Listen, Michael, I quickly have to do an ad break. I'll be back with you now. Super. You should hear what Rick Munn's talking about. New Mexico in the U.S., uh, the Democrats are proposing that all new houses that are being built going forward must have solar panels and charging stations in each new home, drastically increasing building costs. So whether you like it or not, you know, this issue of smart meters comes up and say, well, I'll, I'll never get a smart meter. You'll never get me. But maybe the house that you're buying has one pre-installed or the landlord that you're renting of has one installed, in which case you can't really do anything about it so if you're saying well i'll never have a charging station because i'll never have an electric car for example in new mexico if you're buying a house there if the democrats get their way you're going to have solar panels whether you want them or not and you're going to have a charging port for your ev whether you like it or not and you're going to pay for it whether you like it or not <laughs> that's the way that this thing works it doesn't matter if you want it doesn't matter if you like it doesn't matter if you disagree with it they're going to try and force it through and unless there's serious kickback from this this is actually going to come to pass. Locked and Loaded with Rick Munn on today's News Talk, TNT Radio. A deadly virus emanating from Wuhan, China, is sweeping across the globe. Something is off. The disease caused by the novel coronavirus has been titled COVID-19. What we're being told doesn't add so up. Important. In this crisis that we have, that people Congress passes a multi-billion dollar bill that will bring... There is no cure, no way to treat this illness. 
All we can do is wait for a vaccine. All we can do is wait for a vaccine. There must be a doctor out there who's questioning this. I'm Dr. Peter McCullough. I'm the vice chairman of internal medicine. The only chance to reduce the risks of hospitalization is early home treatment. We can beat this pandemic. Patients actually think the virus is untreatable. There's such a focus on the vaccine. Where's the focus on people sick right now? The pressure to suppress any hope of treatment is extraordinary. Why the single-minded focus on the vaccine? What is that? What is that about? That's really going to be the goal of investigative reporters to figure this out. Unprecedented lockdowns, devastating economic damage, huge violations of personal freedom, families separated from their loved ones, all in the name of a medical emergency. Things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to the entire world. The hope we have of protecting our communities is to get a needle in every arm. I am not going to follow what you are suggesting and let the virus slaughter my patients. John, I'm watching what's happening. This is a treatable illness. I don't think this is a matter of academic debate and confusion. What the evidence shows is that this is an organized criminal enterprise. They call this a business opportunity. People need to know the truth. We are witnessing the greatest organized crime in history to the tune of trillions of dollars. The biopharmaceutical complex is using censorship, propaganda, and manipulation to keep people living in fear. But what we need now is courage. The courage to face COVID-19. Available at courage2facecovid.com. The Net Zero Con in action. Ursula von der Leyen used a private jet to travel just 31 miles. Yet the EU approves France's ban on select short-haul domestic flights. There is no climate emergency. On air 24-7. This is today's News Talk Radio. TNT. Michael, uh, would you say that Americans are st- are still sovereign today? Well, I think it's un- it's being challenged, isn't it? It's being attacked. Um, I-, I think that we are in a conflict, and that is exactly the issue that we're facing right now. We've entered a, a phase, and I talked about describing this crisis of institutions. One element of this is that parts of the executive branch, parts of government, meaning the, the agencies, the surveillance agencies, the law enforcement agencies, and others have started to take excessive powers. You know, we saw this, I was just listening over the break on some of the the, uh, the announcements and adverts around uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown responses, other things. I think it's true in America, and it's true around the world, that governments used that opportunity to acquire additional power. And we saw a lot of violations of uh, legal rights, personal liberties uh, in this country. And so I think you're hitting on a really important point, which is it is not clear. And we are in a, in a fight for it to ensure that this remains a, a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, let me, let me personalize it. Uh, would you classify yourself as sovereign? Well, I, I believe I'm a citizen of a free country. I believe that I have the right to express my views. But I also realize that at any moment that could be taken away from me. You know, we've seen an unprecedented number of conservative voices be silenced, censored, uh, gone after in all sorts of ways. And so I'm certainly not of any illusion that I'm somehow protected from that. And that is the conflict that that I'm in and in, in that I am engaged in a battle to ensure that I can keep my <clears throat> my liberties and keep my sovereignty as a citizen uh, and not have it taken away from me. But I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm aware that that that's a, a vulnerable vulnerable position to be in. You suggested earlier that um, using the legal system and the and the sort of justice institutions uh, is is a, is a good way to to hold the state accountable, uh, so that you can conserve these um, the, these variables, these vectors, such as sovereignty. Mm-hmm. But on a more on a more practical level, uh, for example, I'm a huge fan of guns that's a great great way uh, for sovereignty to be maintained surely 
Well, absolutely. And I'm a very strong believer in what we call the Second Amendment rights, the rights to to bear arms, the idea that you know citizens could not be disarmed. You just go back to the reason it was put in place. Of course, it was a different time. Of course, it was a different era. That wasn't really the point. The founders recognized that the only way that the people could re, re, uh, remain sovereign was having the ability to form militias, to defend themselves, to defend their property, to defend their freedom. And why, therefore, do you think it is in the interest of many uh, authoritarian or, or totalitarian states to take those rights away? It's exactly that, because an armed populist is one that can stand up and, and protect themselves and, and resist oppression, resist tyranny, uh, protect their families and protect their property. So I 100 percent agree uh, with you. And you know, fortunately, that at least for the moment, that right is still observed here in, in the U.S. I heard and i might be wrong but i i heard that uh, texas has more legal firearm owners than the entire u.s military yeah i don't know about that but i know that uh, texas uh, loves texans love their freedoms <laughs> and they love their guns and uh, and they love to, to to hunt and do all sorts of things that i know many south africans can share uh, the same kind of views. Yes. so uh, <laughs> so uh, but it's but it is quite possible it is quite possible Basically, what I'm saying is nobody's going to oppress Texas. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I think you find that, uh, you know, it's not just Texas, but uh, but the many Americans mm. share that view and are, are, are more than willing to, to help stand up for their rights. And by the way, I think that is one of the things that led us to the problems that we're in today. If you look back over the broad uh, uh, swath of history, one of the things that did make America different and unique was there was this high level of civic involvement. Uh, people mm. got out and participated in what was going on in their communities through their churches, through civic organizations, through uh, abolitionist societies before the Civil War, where people were standing up saying, this is wrong, slavery is wrong, slave trade is wrong, we have to do something about it. It's a moral issue, not a legal issue. That kind of involvement really persisted through mid 20th, 20th century, but we've lost it in the last generation. In the last 40 or 50 years, people retired to their couches, they retired behind their screens, they would complain on Facebook or on Twitter or wherever, mm -hmm. but they lost that sense of involvement. There was this idea that, oh, we'll just let the experts do it, we'll let the bureaucrats do it, surely they know better anyhow, let me just get on with my life. And of course, their lives are busy, they've got families, they've got jobs, they've got everything yeah. else. But one of the things that has to change is that we need to get back to a place of real civic involvement of having, again, I talked earlier about the importance of doing things grassroots at the local level, getting to a place where people do get off their couches, do get off from behind their screens and doing whatever they can in, the, in, in their local environment, their local communities to, to make a difference. We need to see that change um, because that's what the, the absence of that is part of what got us in the place where we are today, the trouble we're in today. Mm -hmm. All right, Michael, just hang on a second. Murray's quickly going to do the news headlines. Go ahead. Go ahead. What the hell is this? Breaking news. TNT Radio News. Breaking news. Breaking news. Matt Boyland here with a look at your TNT headlines. Russia has hit out at Germany, blasting Berlin for backflipping on its decision to send tanks to Ukraine. NASA has announced it's teaming up with the US Defense Department to test a nuclear spacecraft before the year 2027. And it's being reported that the blanket ban on Russian tennis players competing at Wimbledon will be reversed this year following widespread condemnation. We're the pinup boys and poster girls for free speech. We just don't look as impressive as Vladimir Putin shirtless on a horse. Yeah, 24-7, 365. We never stop sifting fact from fiction, misinformation from the truth. From government overreach to the latest on mandates, big tech censorship to propaganda gone mad. Listen to TNT Radio and get the news and views direct from our expert presenters and commentators anywhere you go. Ask Alexa. Alexa or Google to play TNT Radio or download the TNT Radio app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Today's news talk. This is TNT Radio. You know, uh, Michael, I, I think it's important for me to point out that while we are talking about the United States and, you know, sort of saving it from uh, neo-Marxist implosion, etc., the, the meta-narrative 
is that whatever happens in the United States expands into the rest of the West because America pretty much is, you know, one of the uh, leaders of the pack, as it were. So if America fails, the entire West fails. And so what you're saying, I think, is not just about the United States because America is not isolated, if that makes sense. You're 100% right. And I talk about this in my book, Why America Matters, which you can find at whyamericamatters.com, which is the idea that America still matters, but not just for itself, but for, as you called it, the West, the entirety of the free world. Why? It's both ideological, as talking about the ideas of, of, of liberty, of equality, uh, of the, the rights that, that are embedded in you know, freedoms of speech and worship and the, the bearing arms, all the things that we've been talking about. Yes, and an even more practical element of the fact that uh, America, for all of its weaknesses and all of its mistakes, still remains uh, a, a leader of the free world and enforcer of things like, uh, let's, let's look at it this way, um, pass it, maritime passageways. You know, the U.S. Navy defends and allows free passage without toll, without piracy, without extract pretty much all the way around the world. You could imagine a world in which uh, the U.S. is no longer performing that capability and say China or someone else or uh, wh whomever was was uh, taking the same role, whether the sea lanes would be as free under that environment as they are today. Look back over the longer history of trade and travel, and of course it wasn't always the case, uh, but in the 20th century we've become accustomed to it because of the freedoms that the U.S. has provided nations around the world without uh, without payment, without recompense. So um, that's just one you know one of many examples one could make, but it, it is absolutely true. And you know what's interesting is we see even here in the U.S. that some of the most uh, patriotic lovers of America are those who have come recently in the last generation or two from places like. Uh, uh, former communist Eastern Europe or from Cuba or from Venezuela. They are the staunchest defenders of the values of America within our own nation, uh, much more so than people who have been here for generations and perhaps gotten lazy or forgotten why it matters. Why is that? Because those immigrants, those new Americans, have seen the devastating consequences of communism, of totalitarianism, of the, the Stasi police in East, uh, East Germany, etc. And they're sending warnings to us as well of where this can lead if we're not careful. I really appreciate your point, though, because I think it matters not just for Americans, it matters for anyone who cares about freedom and liberty around the world. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot bigger than a butterfly effect. You know, what, what if, yes. if the United States coughs, if the United States coughs, the rest, the rest of the world gets a sickness. Right. That's right. That's right. Let me ask you another question. You mentioned China. Is the Chinese Communist mm -hmm. Party a hurdle? Well, I would say that uh, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is much more than a hurdle. I mean, they are arguably the primary uh, adversary and obstacle to the ideas of the U.S. and to the ideas of the West generally. Um, you know, for a, for many, many years, we saw no harm in what China was doing. We didn't understand what they were really after. And you started the show by talking about uh, President Trump. And I think history will show that one of the most important things that President Trump did was to pull the smiley face facade off of the relationship with China to reveal it for what it really was, which was all of the espionage that was going on, all of the theft of intellectual property. All of the spying that was going on in our corporations and in our state and local governments, things that we're still working through today. And it was around the same time that CCP party chair and, 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 head of, and chair of the country, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, revealed in a, in a speech to the party what the ultimate objectives are, which is that you know, China very strongly, the leadership there believes that uh, China has a destiny to restore itself as a dominant force in the world. They themselves are see the, the uh, see America as the adversary, as what they have to overcome, both economically, i.e. to supplant uh, the, the U.S. as the world's leading economic power, but more substantively, that the ideals of America, these ideas of democracy, of freedom, are antithetical to the ideals of the Chinese Communist Party in control. And they have made it their purpose and intent to subvert and undermine 
these ideals, and they're doing it in all sorts of ways, through misinformation, through disinformation, through uh, active campaigns. And so absolutely, more than just an obstacle, it is, uh, it is the challenge of the 21st century for the United States and for the West. But do you think that it's going to evolve from a physical war to an information war uh, between uh, the US and China? It's absolutely in an informational war phase today. I mean, the information war has been going on for some time. Um, interestingly, there is a U.S. agency that keeps track of all of the cyber attacks that they get record of against any uh, corporation or government entity, and it's absolutely spiked uh, since right around the time of the pandemic. There's lots of indications that China is behind a significant portion of that. There is no doubt we are already in an information war phase, uh, what one author called war by other means, this idea of uh, propaganda, yes, information, cyber attacks, other things. Uh, everything short of a kinetic war, everything short of a hot war, which I don't believe uh, is in, in the near term. I think China realizes a couple of things. One, that, that they are still relatively weak in terms of their own domestic economy. There is still significant social unrest and challenges in maintaining order and control internally for the Communist Party. And uh, equally importantly is that the U.S. remains China's largest trading partner. And so I think they are going to continue to um, appear to be playing friendly, but to be doing lots of things behind, uh, behind the scenes as they build their strength, exerting more control in the South China Sea, for example, exerting more pressure on Taiwan and um, continuing to work through a, through a process. But I think we're already in an informational war phase. What does it mean to be an American patriot? Well, it means to, to love your country, to believe um, that, uh, to stand up for the ideas and ideals are worth, that the country is worth fighting for. We've, we've been so confused and so misled in recent uh, decades. And I think you, you, know, you mentioned it at the, the earlier part of the show that uh, it, somehow it's no longer a virtue to love your country, to feel a, a love and affection for the place that you have to call home. And so I think it means to stand for the values, to recognize also that um, the borders matter, that without borders, you have mm. no nation. And I think in America, the issue that we have is not so much with immigration. Immigration has a place when it's legal and done according to national interests and priorities. What is happening here is the same thing that's happened in Western Europe over the last decade or two, which is mass illegal immigration, where those who are coming are not uh, those that we would necessarily want to come, those who can contribute to society, to our economy, but uh, or otherwise, and those who have no interest in uh, becoming American. Well, what does that mean to become American or to become South African or to become whatever? You mm -hmm. have to integrate, meaning you have to be, you find a way to be gainfully employed and pay taxes and, and give back to society, but you also need to assimilate. What does assimilation mean? It means that you adhere to the values of the country, that the, that the country holds dear. You adhere to the language. Uh, you adhere to the ideals of the country. You, you're, you understand and agree with um, you know, basic principles that make whatever country we're talking about special and unique. And unique. If you're unwilling to do either of those things, um, then that sort of mass uh, immigration actually becomes extremely divisive, divisive and dilutive to the fabric of the nation. So patriotism is about loving your country, but also defending it, defending its values, defending its ideals. Mass immigration is a serious, serious problem. I mean, my wife and I were in Paris uh, just before this COVID nonsense, and I, yeah. I was a bit shocked. It it didn't look like the the, the France that I was expecting. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was completely uh, let's, let's say non French. Um, it, I mean, uh, you you could have excused it for being the capital of Pakistan. Yeah. And one of the things that's happening, and this is why I say this is not just a, an American issue, you're seeing uh, countries across France, people, the citizens of those, excuse me, not just France, across Europe, begin to push back on this, realizing that things have gone too far. 
Um, you look at the leading political parties across almost all of these nations now, and they are uh, populist and nationalist. Nationalist meaning they want greater restrictions on, uh, on, on immigration. They want it to be safe and legal and controlled to numbers that can be sustained. The other just plain simple fact is uh, these countries, and, and mine included, just cannot handle the sheer number, the millions of refugees or immigrants or whatever you call them uh, in terms of, of, of being able to afford them. And it's hurting, especially the working and middle class citizens of these countries who are paying taxes and now paying, paying for immigrants and uh, are struggling uh, with competition for, for jobs and for social services, hospitals, schools, whatever it might be. So I think um, it's the, the, the West is waking up, Europe is waking up to the costs and consequences of this, uh, this great uh, migratory wave that has gone on for the last decade or so. Douglas Murray wrote a great book called uh, The Strange Death of Europe. And yes. if, the United States, if the United States is not careful, it will be the strange death of America. Yeah. And I mentioned it in my book for exactly that reason, that this is a bit what uh, what Murray had to say about Europe, I write in Why America Matters, is a prophetic warning uh, to the U.S. Because to your point, uh, and he's very articulate about the cost, costs and consequences across Europe and in the U.K. and elsewhere, and the same issues are happening now. Under our current uh, administration, under the Biden administration, we have seen an inestimable number, but it is, close, it is t millions and millions, if not tens of millions, of illegal immigrants pouring across the southern border of the United States. And it's overwhelming the border cities. It's overwhelming cities around the country. It is a massive problem. And unfortunately, our government is not doing anything uh, or enough about it in this day and age. We're prepared to send what turns out to be commitments of nearly $100 billion to to the Ukraine and to support uh, border security in Jordan and the Middle East. But somehow we can't seem to uh, secure and control our own border. That is not sustainable. And it's a very dangerous trend. Um, Michelle, who's in Florida and listening right now, she has a question for you, Michael. She's asking, do we have shared values in this country still? It's a fantastic question, Michelle, as I talk about in my Why America Matters, that one of the problems in the, in, the, in, the, in the crisis of identity I discussed that we have never been more divided. Well, that's not true. Actually, we have been more divided. We were this divided or more. Uh, in the years and the decades leading up to the Civil War, where the country was basically split over the issue of slavery and over the question of what do we do about it. And while I, I don't know that this situation is quite as bad as, as that was, because that obviously resulted in a civil war, it tore the country apart. It took 70 years to resolve the issue of slavery within the nation and then with some lingering effects where it still wasn't perfected for a very long time. But I think Michelle is asking a great question because she's right. Because if you look at poll after poll right now, I call it the you call I call it the 40, 40, 20, which is 40 percent of the people are you know, strongly conservative, concerned about all these things that I'm describing. 40 percent think they don't matter, uh, and that, uh, that I'm wrong, that we're wrong, that this is not the way to go. And then you have this 20 percent of people who just don't care. They're too apathetic. Keep me out of politics. I don't want to hear about it. Let me get back to my video games and my whatever, my entertainments. And, and to me, so there are two different issues here. One is somehow waking up the 20% to realize what's going on in this nation, realize how it's going to affect them and it's going to matter. And secondly, because I do believe that the radical left, the progressive extremes, uh, that, that, other, that other side, that they're misinformed that they that they're being lied to you know one of the big revelations for me that led me on this path of writing was to realize how uh, how fake news was real and how big of an issue it was so what do i mean by that for example all the misinformation uh, basically all of the mainstream media in this country has become compromised and corrupted is no longer telling the truth we've lost independent journalism and so that other 40 percent that sits on the other side of the table on many of these issues they're still listening to things that uh, I will tell you are outright lies. And so I would argue that, no, we don't actually need to give 40, you know, give half of our airtime to ideas that are patently false. We need to be strongly convincing with the truth about what's going on. But, uh, but it's actually a very important point because I don't know that that changes overnight. People are embedded in what they believe. 
even if they're wrong, they don't want to know that they're wrong. Uh, it's sort of a, a willful blindness to the things that are going on around them. So at the same time, I am hopeful and optimistic because I think that people do want the truth. They're confused, they're misled, they're being propagandized, if that's a word. And ultimately though, most people like the truth. Most people wanna know uh, what's really going on and care about the same ideas of equality, of freedom, et cetera. So I said it before, but I do think we're in a, in a battle for the heart and soul of, of this nation as, as many nations are around the world. All right, Michael, I'm quickly going to do my last ad break. I'll be back with you now. Give me a minute with TNT Radio's Steve Malsberg. I'm sure most, if not all of you, know the Aretha Franklin classic, A Natural Woman, released in 1968. Here she is singing it for President Obama and the First Lady at the Kennedy Center in 2015. Well, a group called Transcultural Mindfulness Alliance tweeted the following last week. Aretha Franklin's 1968 song, Natural Woman, perpetuates multiple harmful anti-trans stereotypes. There's no such thing as a natural woman. The song has helped inspire acts of harm against transgender women, and they requested it be removed from Spotify and Apple Music. The story went viral, including major publications, but the same group tweeted this out on Monday. Based on the sheer ridiculousness of the content of this page, how could journalists not comprehend this is a parody satire site? The New York Post claims the group issued a follow-up tweet denying they are a parody. The link to that tweet does not work. Let's just assume that they are a parody site, and this was satire. It's still only a matter of time before someone goes after the song for real. Thanks for giving me a minute. I'm Steve Malsberg for TNT Radio. Challenging the consensus and debunking the narrative. This is Viewpoint. The world is transitioning to so-called renewable energy, which is a form of economic suicide. More than 60% of the world's electricity generation comes from fossil fuels. Only 6% comes from wind power and 3% from solar. But more importantly, fossil fuels currently make up more than 80% of total world primary energy consumption. Oil remains the single largest source of global energy, which is mostly used in transport. Therefore, the energy generated from wind turbines makes up just 1% of total world primary energy consumption, and solar power half of 1%. Renewables will not achieve net zero carbon, but the economic destruction under this agenda is severe and will get much worse unless this madness ends. Jeremy Nell on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Michael, in the United States, where is the real conflict actually happening? Uh, it's happening on many, many fronts. I go back to when you drill down and you go to the heart of it, it becomes an ideological conflict. It becomes a conflict about do we believe that there is a, there is a truth out there? Uh, it's interesting to see that as political parties have splintered uh, in, in the U.S., or, or I shouldn't say splintered, polarized uh, between the, the left and the right, one of the key attributes is uh, the, the fundamental questions like, is there a God? Is there a truth? Is there right and wrong? Is there an absolute, moral is there an absolute morality that, that guides our decisions? I mean, one of the things that made America great and unique from the very beginning was this deep religiosity and observers from Alex Tocqueville to Charles, uh, uh, to people for Dickens, to people from all over the world, they would come to the U S uh, in the mid 19th century. And they would wonder at this, like, why is it that this, these people uh, <clears throat> seem to have placed such a high importance of religion uh, in their life and in their public life. That was something that distinguished uh, America from Europe and from the rest of the world. It was founded by people who actually cared. They had left Europe because they wanted religious freedom. They wanted the freedom to worship God. And even among the founders who may not have shared those personal religious beliefs, they recognized very clearly that for a democratic republic to work, like what the United States was trying to construct, the importance of religion. Why is that? Because without, without a God, there's no religion. Without religion, there's no morality. And without morality, there's neither truth nor trust. And trust was this like essential 
hidden ingredient that was necessary to make democratic institutions work. When you lose truth, you lose trust. And this, I would argue, is the biggest issue between right and left in this country today. The Democratic Party have become the, the party of, of secularism and atheism, whereas the right, the conservative side, adheres to values around uh, belief in God, belief that that uh, families matter, that um, that that uh, that it should still have an important role to play. Go back, and the biggest argument that the left makes is this idea of the separation of church and state as a way to say, no, no, religion has no place. Faith has no place in public life. It's absolutely not true. Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, what he wrote, which is often misquoted, to make a point, which was to keep the state, to keep government out of the church, out of financing it, out of influencing it, out of prescribing how one could or could not worship keep the state out of out of religion it was never intended to keep faith out of the public life and out of the political sphere uh because again without a a faith-based moral uh, uh morality it's very hard to adhere to ideals of truth or trust one of the best autobiographies that i've ever read um, is righteous indignation by andrew breitbart who i think was ahead of his time and uh, he echoes um, a number of points that you've made. Do you think that there needs to be a return to that mindset of the Tea Party? So, it's a great question. It's it's a, it's a bit complicated. You know, I do argue in my book that on the one hand, we need to restore and resurrect some of these ideals and some of these values. On the other hand, I do call what my book, Why America Matters, the case for a new exceptionalism, because there's no doubt that in many ways, the challenges that we face in this country and around the world in the 21st century are different than the ones that were faced in the 19th century or the 21st century. Um, in the 19th century, America was extremely isolationist. It had left Europe for good reason, including getting out of the continental wars and empire building that was going on. And we lived in this world of so-called splendid isolation for uh, really until the First World War. What was happening in Europe drew us back in, but then the pendulum swung all the way to the other extreme, this idea of inter interventionalism, which became hyper-interventionalism, which became the U.S. as the global policeman around the world. We got to a point where we never saw a war we didn't like, you know, 20 years in Iran, excuse me, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, and now we're, uh, mm. we're, we're, we're falling further and further uh, into the war in Ukraine. You saw the announcements the other day from the U.S. and Germany of sending heavier tanks uh, into the conflict. We've got this ratcheting escalation. I argue that that is no longer appropriate either, that the endless wars at the turn of the, of the millennium illustrated the, the folly of imperialism in many ways, that uh, to be a patriot and nationalist is very different than advocating for empire, uh, and that we need to be more circumscript about how we engage um, in, 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 in affairs around the world. Of course, you're aware that uh, that in Africa, you know, the Chinese have been undertaking mm. a form of uh, neo-colonialism in many ways, uh, resource nationalism, and I don't think that's good for uh, for Africa at all. And th you know, that's one example. But to, to get back to your point, the Tea Party, um, I do believe that uh, you know, Tea Party. What was it? In, in essence, it was a a populist movement. It was a movement of Americans who wanted to um, get back to to we the people. I mean, yes, I think that's very much alive, and I think that's essential. Not the Tea Party itself. I think that's sort of had its time. But the idea of we the people, the idea of greater civic involvement, the ideas of uh, of, of, of a populist movement, and in, and standing up and enforcing the ideas that our leaders need to represent um, the people, else we will move them on and put someone else in place. Would you say a little more Ron Paul and a little less neocon? Uh, I would I would tend to agree with that. I think the <laughs> the interesting thing, I, I make another comment that I say in, in, a, in a strange way, the conflict in the U.S. is no longer uh, about right versus left. Why do I say that? It's yeah. Because you think about the, the values of the traditional left were 
privacy, you know, get, get keep us out of wars, keep us out of imperialist endeavors, um, smaller state, keep, you know, keep me free from surveillance, bodily autonomy, all that sorts of things. Well, now that old school left has more in common with the populist conservative right of today than either of them do with the supporters of, of big government, of the surveillance state, the neocons on left, uh, or, you know, Democrats and the Republicans who, again, are uh, very interventionalist and support the uh, the ever increasing power of the federal government. So the axis has shifted politically here in the U.S. That you have, uh, in, in a way, freedom and independence-loving people on both sides of the political aisle, uh, seeing some but some things happen that uh, that they want to resist. Michael, it's uh, it's been such a great pleasure chatting to you. Um, we are running out of time, so let me just quickly um, promo you. Where can I find more of your work and your writing? Yeah, so you can find the book itself, Why America Matters, at whyamericamatters.com. It's also available on Amazon and other uh, online resources. You can uh, hear more and, and read more about me and about my writings at stormwall.com. That's one word, stormwall.com. Uh, check it out, all the YouTube videos, everything else, interviews like this, you can find uh, there as well. I'd very much like to have you back in the near future because I think I think we need more um, American opinions like yours, if that's okay with you. Would love to do so. All the best to you uh, and, uh, and to your audience. Yeah, and just before you go, Michael, I just want to say that I agree America does matter. Um, and, and that's coming from somebody who lives on the African continent. <laughs> yes. Understood. Michael, Understood. Walker, it matters Michael Wilkerson, all thank you. S- <laughs> thank you for joining me in the trenches, Michael Wilkerson. Thank you, sir. Uh,